issues there with fonts. Um, my background is as a graphic designer. About 15 years ago, started um, going in the direction of interactive design, UX design. Most of my experience came from working with Microsoft really closely with their transition into Windows 8 and Windows 10. Uh, learned a lot of things through user testing and, and that sort of thing at that point. But I traveled the world teaching people about design of all things. Um, I go to Nike twice a month to teach them how to create keynote presentations, which cracks me up because it's a $19 program. <laughs> but, you know, there's design in everything. And um, there's things that you need to know, like proportion and space and type. And there's things that if you understand, you can use them as a, almost like a formula. And so if you understand that a really good design um, and things that are readable are flush left, you flush left. If you're weak in design, you're like, I don't know what to do, you center everything, which would be a non-designer thing to do. So if you just know what works, then you can take advantage of this stuff and make yourself more confident. A lot of the confidence comes from understanding where we're coming from because my theory is that information design was done really well early 1900s. Um, the fierce reduction of unnecessary elements, all this beautiful design and communication was done well. Then desktop publishing came out um, 1980s and on. People discovered they could change the fonts 40 times on one screen, they can do drop shadows, they can make things blink, and that's when design went to hell for all these years, and now people are pulling it back in and saying, um, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. And this is not a game. When you're creating a website for an organization or a company, it's information. It's not Pong or, you know, Fortnite or whatever. It's supposed to be clean information. And so sometimes you have to edit yourself and just take yourself back. And um, what it does is it actually helps you in the long run. So why care about design of the past? Um, it does save you time. Because if you understand things that work, you're not nudging stuff around like, maybe I should put it here, maybe I should put it here. Does it look good here? Like you know from past experience what works well and what might not work well. Your uh, work looks more confident because you're putting it down and you're leaving it because you're following a rule. Uh, it takes some stress away. It takes a lot of stress away because you're like, well, this is a rule and even though I might not like it myself, um, I know that it's aesthetically pleasing and it impresses others around you. And you see this, I mean, companies that design well, organizations that design well, um, they have been proven to even do financially well. So, you know, you think of companies that, uh, like Nike, for instance, all the way down to their boxes, or Apple Computer, um, all the way down to the little technical form that comes with your uh, earbuds, all that crazy stuff that they think about. So in order to do this, I'm gonna give you a little, I call it the 10 minute art history, and then after that I'm going into tips and tricks that come from art history and will help make it, um, hopefully, something that you can apply almost immediately. But today, uh, design today is created by important events of the past. Um, I'm just starting with the early 1900s. I'm not going any further back than this because this is pretty much where you see the influence of information design that is present today. And there was a time called new objectivity, early 1900s. The emphasis was on technology. You have to think about the early 1900s. This is when the Industrial Revolution came about. So prior to this time period, things could be created or handcrafted individually. But then mass production came into place and things had to be more streamlined in order to be created more quickly. But um, with that change, um, things were uh, styled differently and styled with a purpose. And I'm gonna mention some names here that people I found fascinating uh, at this time. Peter Behrens, he worked for a company called AEG, Electrical Company, and this was in Germany, um, really, interesting back then because electricity is just discovered. So the electrical company was like Apple computer. It was very cool and it was very hip to work for an electrical company because they had electricity but they had nothing working on electricity. So they had to create fans and washing machines and like all kinds of stuff. They had to design things to work on electricity. So um, he 
worked for that organization, started designing all sorts of things, graphics, but also fans and um, even architecture. But he was actually the first recognized industrial designer. And that is all about usability, you know, being an industrial designer, and it totally reflects on um, print and web design as well. So he used design to create unified appearances and things. That tea kettle he designed on the left actually could be configured um, into like 30 different tea kettles because all the parts were, um, um, could be switched from one teapot to another. The workspace on the right looks just like a regular workspace with glass walls, but back then that was a real innovation and it was so that they could limit their supervisors to maybe one supervisor for all these people because they had the glass wall. So everything had a reason. He also um, created architecture. This was their building. A little, got a little graffiti on it at this point. There's another designer at this time that's also interesting, um, Van de Velde, and he was actually a painter. And so you see a lot of artists back then who were sculptors and painters who took advantage of um, transforming themselves at this time. They almost had to because there was such a need for designers uh, that wasn't and didn't exist prior to this time period. So he served as an architect, interior designer, designer teacher. He designed furniture, silverware, jewelry, and other creations. Um, but he was one of the first designers to design like an entire set of silverware, like thinking of how you could use design in everyday things, which was um, pretty, pretty new. And he did bring art to industry as well. And so this furniture back in the early 1900s. So um, at this time, there was an association started called the Work Fund. And it was started by, uh, it was a state-sponsored um, arts and crafts organization started in Germany. This is where you first started to hear about form determined by function, elimination of all ornament. And that is something, again, bringing it back to nowadays that you have to also think about, like, elimination of all ornament. Are you just designing it because you know some cool thing? Or are you designing it to help get somebody the information they need? So there was an elevated functional aesthetic uh, quality at that time um, in the mass-produced objects. So next time here, moving into 1918, where the war ends, this was a critical time period in design. More things needed to be designed to use electricity. This is when they started creating um, washing machines and that sort of thing. Does anyone know whose logo that is in the lower right? Genius. Yeah, right. That was the original logo. But um, so a really critical time. And the country that recognized this best was Germany, again. And it's funny. But if you think about today when you're buying products, if you're looking at dishwashers or whatever, you might actually still think it's German engineered, so it's probably better. And that was because of the influence of the Bauhaus School that was started in 1919. It was a school that offered trainer, training for designers. It was a school specifically for designers of all things, whether textiles or architecture or graphic design, um, industrial design but it was free to people who qualified. And the whole purpose of it was because Europe was economically poor at that time and Germany recognized that this was their opportunity to offer something to make them much more significant um, in the world. And it really did pay off at that time. So it began, it began with the utopian definition, the building of the future. They took the best designers around and organized them in, uh, in order to teach other people. They shared the marvels of the modern industry. Again, things that, key things that come up at this point that I'm gonna keep playing on. Emphasize pure perfection, simplified design. Um, provide affordable, artistic, utilitarian design for every class. And so this statement came out at that time. Honesty of construction, death to decoration. So if you think of like decoration now, that might be you know your starburst on your page or something like that. But if you look at things that were done at that time, they're very clean, very simple. The architecture, furniture, they don't have like gold things stuck to them or shapes routed on the sides or um, odd patterns um, playing into the wood, that sort of thing. And it's also the time when they really focus more on doing 
fundamental, simple things like building for a soft machine, prior to this time period, people didn't really think of chairs a whole lot. And so they thought of chairs, and this is one of the chairs that they created at that time, but it looks so clean and it's so well designed that it could almost be out here in the lobby and you wouldn't realize that it was almost 100 years old. So just the style that they had is almost timeless. So balance became a philosophy and the philosophy is stuff that you guys want to think about in everything you do. Eliminate elements that do not matter. I was watching your presentation, which was really good, but the issue with the design there is everything is there. You know, like maybe you were talking about the information architecture, eliminate elements that do not matter. I mean, when you first come to that page, maybe everything's not there. Maybe, you know, it's categorized better, you know, so that you can click on different pages and find what you need instead of having everything. And if a good example of that's Craigslist, you know, it's like you go there, everything is there. Like if they had just some drop down menus, wow, that would be nice. And that's that eliminate elements that do not matter. You know, I'm looking for a job, not looking for, for a house or a car. Um, form follows function. So build it so it works well. Where you see this, examples, if you've ever gone to a website, where you have to click on something to see, like they want you to like peel a page away or something, like they add extra elements there instead of just giving you the information. Everything is designed, and I try to get people to feel this um, in everything they do. If you're doing a Word doc, a Google doc, anything. Maybe use a nice type hierarchy, a nice typeface. Make everything look good because it starts to influence everything you do. Keep your desk neat. Hang pictures up nicely. Like let it influence everything you do. Clean a closet out. Do something. But that's all going to help you uh, even create websites and applications much better. So make design accessible. Avoid over stylizing. That's that philosophy. If you see the difference, what? I don't even know how to get to that. Okay, skip this version. Yeah, that's my sketch running in the background. So, um, everyday games. This is the time period prior to what you're seeing with the Bauhaus time period. A chessboard, very beautiful, very ornate. You look at the one that is, um, let me come back to this. There we go. Designed during the Bauhaus time period. Very simple, very clean. You can still buy this if you want to invest $300. But it shows you the directions that you can move based upon the piece. So again, building that geniuses into the form um, you know, and the functionality, kind of melding with, get them together. So why it's not around today is in 1933, the Nazis came in power. And they felt that they were doing uh, that they were experimentalists. Um, there were some artists who were creating some anti-government posters at that time, but not really. I mean, the school should have been left open, but they did shut it down. Um, all the contracts for the staff were canceled, and they forced many of the artists to immigrate. Some went to the U.S. for about a year. There was a Chicago Bauhaus school that, that went under, um, but many went to Switzerland. And then, so... Um, there was a gentleman uh, by the name, well, Walter Gropius, the gentleman who started Bauhaus. Anybody near Lincoln, Mass, who knows the Walter Gropius house? Okay, so that's where he actually went to lead um, Harvard's design school after um, the Bauhaus was shot, but that's his house, and they offer tours of it, which is really cool. And they offer evening things, so like if you want a cool date, you know, you can go out there at the evening, and they sort of hors d'oeuvres and stuff, but it looks really... Um, it's a really cool place. So I'm uh, moving into the Swiss design. And um, around the 1940s, because that's a transition from that Bauhaus time period. And since many of those artists went to Switzerland, it makes sense to, to flow here. Um, when I say Swiss design, it's not a specific style um, to Switzerland. It, is, it merged in Russia, Germany, Netherlands. It became what's called international style, international typographic style. So if you hear that, that's the same thing as Swiss style, and um, also called Swiss legacy. But the Swiss have always had a flair for design, even um, their passports are beautifully designed, very clean. But here are some of the things that I just want you to think about when you design things. The international typographic style 
By the way, is what you see, um, Tesla, Target, uh, Nike, Apple, Google, those are all called the international typographic style, the type of style they're using, where you see a lot of white space and a lot of really clean text. And there's certain, um, there are certain properties that you can put into your style that will make it look more like that, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable, okay? Like, because it does, I, I see it all the time. Like people centering everything and I say flush it left and they're like, no. But then when they do, the design is a hundred times stronger. You know, like it depends on what you're doing or what you're designing. But th these are some of the things that can help you. So the international typographic style, same thing as to a style. They use asymmetric layouts. I'm gonna talk about this later. I'm gonna tell you how you can use space because um, if you don't understand proportions, uh, and you try to do something asymmetric. Asymmetric means something heavy on one side and something small on the other. If you don't understand proportions in space, it looks amateur. But there are mathematical rules that you can follow so that you can just drop stuff down and it makes sense. They use their grid on everything. And I'm not talking about layout grid going down. I'm talking about a baseline grid of the text going over. Like text always lines up and images line up and icons line up on a grid. Sans serif typefaces, so these are the typefaces that don't have the little endpoints on them. Um, that's sans serif. And flush left, ragged right. When I say flush left, ragged right, this is flush left, a line left. Ragged right means you just let it fall where it falls. You don't justify it or try to align it on both sides. And they had a preference for photography in place of illustrations at that time. I also like to mention a gentleman who has had a lot of influence on the design you see today that was around at that time, um, Dieter Rams, and he has a whole book on less is more, but Dieter Rams worked for a company called Braun. Um, this is one of the products that he created, and it was actually a, a record player. Um, it played 45s, and it broke into two pieces, and it really had nothing on it but an on and off and a volume, which was incredible incredibly simple. No extra metal on it or anything strange like that. It just so happens that there was a gentleman who, as a child, his parents bought a juicer that was designed by Dieter Rams, and he was so fascinated with it because it would juice when he put the citrus in and stop when he lifted it up, that he went on to design many of the things that you see and use today. In fact, if you look at Dieter Rams' design of a radio on the left, and Jonathan Ives' design of the iPod on the right, very similar, like that was his mentor, and that was Jonathan Ives who got that juicer when he was younger. But he went on to design many other things following that really clean, simple design, fierce reduction of unnecessary elements. I actually have my old Mac and won't replace it because I think they fiercely reduced too much in the new one <laughs> because you have to carry around all the adapters. Like I can actually plug the HDMI cord right into my computer, which is unheard of nowadays. Mm -hmm. But he, um, Dieter Rams also came up with 10 principles of good design. Good design is innovative, makes a product useful, it's aesthetic, makes a product understandable, unobtrusive, it's honest, long lasting, thorough down to the last detail, environmentally friendly, and as little design as possible. So these are things that you want to consider as well. Uh, I'm just going to check the time as I go through here. Good, I'm right. Uh, as you go through designing. So I'm done with the art history. That's the furthest I'm going to go. I'm going to go into some things that we can learn from what I just showed you. What helpful design principles can you learn? Less is more. And that is a tough thing to get used to. But how do you make less more? You don't give the user more than they ask for. Don't give them everything on the screen. Focus on the needs of the user, not the design. Don't do something just because you think it's a cool thing to do. And eliminate distractions. So give you some examples. And I feel bad because I do know some people that worked on this site. But... Um, Here's exactly what I'm talking about. I log in and I'm not going anywhere, but yet I have flight status and check-in, okay? Like those, if you're designing things in the Bauhaus really simplified, fierce reduction of unnecessary elements, it's intelligent. 
like it says, she doesn't have any flights canceled. What? We're not going to give her that box. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. And also maybe some of the marketing stuff. But all these items could be just left off, and it might be just book travel. So over here, you can see the um, difference between like United, all these things on here, and American. You know, I log into that. It's like you have upcoming trips. You know, you have one. I think I eliminated the number there. But down at the bottom, flight satisfying trip book flights. But it's what I need at that time. Um, fierce reduction of unnecessary elements. Showing you some examples of this through the years. That's Google's logo in 1998. And then um, about 2010, can you see the reduction of unnecessary elements? Like the shadow's gone, right? And it's not embossed anymore. And then now it's like they don't even have serifs. It's straight even line width. Um, there's a reason for that. I mean, it's because that can be reproduced in lots of different ways. But it's also companies and organizations are saying, whoa, all this stuff, let's put the brakes on. Let's just go back to really clean, simple design. A lot of people are like, whoa, Apple, new flat art, you know, new flat design um, a few years ago. But now that you've seen that little 10 minute crash course in art history, you probably recognize they were just going back to the international typographic style. They're just going back to Swiss and they're saying, hey, that um, shininess, that's just not necessary. We don't need that. Um, any of you who worked in, anyone work in Windows 8? <laughs> That was like a disaster, right? <laughs> Fierce reduction of unnecessary elements beyond anything good, um, where you couldn't even quit applications. And I know, because I worked with the team, we actually did their training worldwide for developers to build what they called Metro apps at that time, but they wouldn't even let us see the operating system. It wasn't tested. Like they didn't let people outside their little team work on it. So 10 was very different. They now have testing, user testing every Friday afternoon, and you know it's a great um, operating system now, but it just goes to show you how you should probably talk to your users. But they, <laughs> but they which is, you know, a lot of people don't. Um, they felt that rounded corners were unnecessary chrome, so they don't have any rounded corners in their operating system. Like they're, and if you notice, they follow a grid. Like even though there's lots of image, it, tiles here, like everything, all the text aligns on a grid. Like there's little details there that you see, you know, how they were following that international typographic style as they build it. Um, if you guys have not gone to linkscar.com, I highly recommend it. This is the best site ever if you want to see everything not to do. But it is incredible. Um, he, ha he apparently has won some awards. I don't know. But, but you can see the chrome here, right? Like there's a lot of stuff there that isn't really necessary. So how do you eliminate unnecessary objects? Uh, we were told in art school, my undergrad is uh, a BFA in communication design. And that, back then we didn't even have computers. But my teacher would always say, um, borders are a sign of design weakness. Like if you have to put everything in a border, that means that you don't know what you're doing. Now forms are, are another thing. Of course, in forms you're gonna need boxes and things like that. But what um, my professor was indicating was that if I was trying to separate content from something else, maybe my headline had to have an exaggerated size difference. Maybe I needed more space between those objects instead of cramming them so close together. Like there's other ways that you can separate content. You don't always need a box around it. Do you really need the drop shadow? I mean, think about it hard. Does it really need to be in 3D? Do you have to put gradients all over the place? So those are things that you have to think about. So the next thing, that was less is more. The next thing, form follows function. Um, giving you an example of two different apps that are both mobile. This one on the left is called Navbug. And if you're looking for traffic reports, this is your screen. It has no clue where you are. You have to click on it. It's got ads all over the place. So if you think about it, you're driving, and if you're driving around here, you're going at least 80 miles per hour, and you have to still see that little button that says, you know, I-93, and then you have to tell it south. Like, it's not 
intelligent. It's not recognizing what you need as far as functionality. Whereas, of course, if you go on Waze or Google, it like starts you right out. It knows where you are. It gives you the help that you need. And that's something that you have to think about in the design process is that initial screen. Like, what is this person trying to do? They clicked on this or they opened this app. What is the scenario that they are in the middle of and how can I make that more simple? A good example is um, BWI. Um, they're not perfect, but they do give you some uh, different information. It's very responsive and it thinks about the scenarios that you might be in. So their desktop app is, what do you need help with today? And it puts the scenarios right on there. I'm planning a trip, I'm flying from BWI, I'm arriving, I'm picking someone up. So these, they probably talk to the users and they're like, what do you do, what do you do most of the time when you interact with BWI? And it's apparent and it's obvious that they've talked to the users and they know what is more important. If you switch to their mobile phone app, it's genius because it just says, oh, well this time you're probably driving so you probably need a big chunky button that says flight status and parking availability. Like these are the things that are probably important to you at this time. So again, they did some research and they let it play out, but that's also fierce reduction of unnecessary elements because they're not giving me um, airport map and they're not letting me book things or whatever or find restaurants. It's just sit really simple and clean. I can still go to the menu and get the rest of the information, but that's not what their uh, primary scenarios were that they found. I just have to show this next screen because if you open their, their uh, desktop app all the way open, this is the most ridiculous bad design um, thing I've seen. It's a video. It's a humongous video. Instead of um, taking advantage of that space for things that are really critical or important, they put a video that's actually, you know, probably taking a little while to download and it's the city moving in the window. That is exactly designing for no other reason than to make a cool design. Like somebody thought, this is cool, but it doesn't really serve a purpose, you know? So just think about that. And I mentioned Craigslist before, talking about here's, here's an example of not giving somebody the, um, that fierce reduction of unnecessary elements. I go here and it's about everything. Like it could be made so much more simple if they just broke things down. Like it could just even be drop down and say, oh, you're looking for community? Oh, you're looking for services? Like simple things like that. Like don't show everyone everything because it's not important to everyone. So how do you create um, these functional forms? You work on the scenarios and stories to figure out what you should focus on. You work on a mind map. Um, you create an application statement for everything you do. So let me explain those two things. A mind map is when you put up, maybe I'm doing something on sponge rollers, which is really funny because my husband just walked in the back and he, he knows that I ran into stop and shop with a sponge roller in my hair the other day. But, um, <laughs> But if I'm thinking about them, you, whatever, like maybe I'm creating something for the airport, but a mind map allows you to branch out ideas, like sponge rollers, they're comfortable, you can wear them to bed, they're compact, they're good for travel. You bubble out things. It's like um, a brainstorm where you just throw everything on the wall, but it helps you to think about things that maybe you hadn't thought of. And a, the best mind map is one that goes out and spirals out you know, several um, different legs into different bubbles. But doing something like that helps you think about what's more important and discover what's more important before you start to design. The other thing is that application statement or what we call best app statement. If your app or your website is um, going to help somebody find the best real estate in the city at the price that they can afford, like write it down, put exactly what it does down because that helps you focus on what's important and it stops feature creep. Because if you build a really good uh, application statement and then somebody comes in and they're like, hey, it'd be really cool if we also put a weather widget in here. You could say, yeah, but that's gonna be a distraction. That's gonna take away from um, what's important. So let's just stay with what we decided was going to be good. You also want to respect the grid. And when I say that, 
Um, you know, the grid, it is the underlying structure for modeling and archiving human thoughts, interactions, and events. Been around a long time. Really important. Um, you can see it was used in Swiss design at this time. This will drive you crazy, right? Okay, do you see? It's off. So if somebody's looking at a website or a design, they're like, ah, uh, it's called noise. Um, it bothers people. But as soon as it comes into place and everything's aligned and distributed and it's on the grid, then you feel better and you can pay attention to the content. So don't give people sloppy stuff. We align everything to the grid. Um, and um, this was an illustrator, but we base our grid on the letting or the space between each line. So you can see every piece of text lines up on um, text. And I'll talk about that in a quick bit. So you really want to understand typography. Um, that's serif at the top. That's sans serif at the bottom. And it doesn't matter whether you use sans serif or serif. I went to school a long time ago, and I was always told that if you're using large blocks of text, people read serif easier because they connect the letters together. Um, this is a test from a really great website. It's called Science Direct, where you can buy usability uh, reports for like 20, 25 bucks. But what they found was when they gave readability studies to university students, they found that if they were in sans serif versus serif, it made absolutely no difference when they came to answering questions at the end, that it was the um, same amount of comprehension. And that's because, and also, uh, another thing that was discovered by tracking people's eyes, and so that's an eye tracker on the top of that <coughs> monitor, is that people don't actually read from letter to letter. They read statically, which means they're like all over the place. So use whichever one works best. Um, if you're choosing a font, make sure a big thing you want to pay attention to is the baseline. This is the baseline. That's what we use for our grid, not down here. But also that you really open counters. So if somebody comes to you and they're like, well, we always use Palatino in our print material. Palatino has really small counters. And when you break it down into pixels, it's not going to be readable. So you might have to choose a different font um, for online. But here are some characteristics. Um, X height, which is the size of a lowercase x, 65 to 80% of the cap height, strong counters, straight even line width, no excessive descenders, all important. And even though you think cursive might look cool or script, um, kids today can't read it because they're not taught cursive in school. So um, be wary of that. Also use a typographic grid. And I'll explain this. In fact, I'm, burn I'm gonna skip. Uh, let me make sure I've got time here. I've got nine minutes, good. Um, I'm gonna just skip and just show you this in Illustrator. I use Illustrator, I use lots of different applications. But um, just real quick demonstration of this. I'm going to say I've got some text in here, and I'm going to go ahead and put some dummy text in. I'm going to just right click in here and say, and start with. Oh, shoot. Sorry about that. Mm, let me go in. That's right. I'm on a Mac. On the PC, it automatically switches. On here, mirror. There we go. Okay, so close all that up. All right, so all I did was I created a new document and then I right clicked and I said insert placeholder content. Point being, because I'm not gonna teach you Illustrator, I did that last year actually, but um, you, you set this up so that um, it looks the way you want it to look, you know, in your app or your website, and then um, you look at the letting. And that's the space between the lines. And when I look at this, it looks like this is 25. I'm going to make this 25, make it even. But then I just go into my preferences, and I will tell it that um, preferences, guide, and grid, that I want a grid line every 25 points. And maybe I want it to subdivide by 4 and have those grids in front. So I put this in, and when I turn on my grids, so it's just a view option at this point, then, let me go ahead in. All right, 
you, I'm going to have to do it manually because for whatever reason, show grid, there it is. You'll see that every line of text falls on that because it's based on the lighting. And then as I'm building things, like I make sure that if I'm making a picture that it aligns on that grid, you know, like everything aligns on the grid, whether it's an icon that's being placed. If I'm putting another line of text in, then I'm always lining it up with the, that grid. So headline, you know, even if it's a different size, um, but I don't do anything random. Like when I do this, it's like, okay, that's going to start on a grid as well. That is what Dieter Rams referred to as um, attention to detail. And it does show up. Like what happens is your designs look really clean and really Swiss. And um, so you can do that with CSS. You can set that up. I'm going to go back into PowerPoint and just talk about this a little bit more. Hopefully we can see this. Oh, that we're going to lose it again. Okay. Um, the other thing to think about, Jan Teschold was a, also a designer in the early 1900s. He compared type to music. Large letters are used for emphasis in text as loud notes are used for emphasis in music or loud voices. So create a type ramp. Try to stick with five six, seven different type sizes and styles so that you um, can build a hierarchy of information. So somebody will recognize that top um, size as being something really critical and important that they should pay attention to. And then the tertiary size is always consistent so they know that maybe that's not as important. So you can see it done really well on some of these websites where they exaggerate that type size. If you're trying to follow the Swiss design, you make your different uh, type sizes in your type ramp visually twice the size. You exaggerate them. And the reason why is so that people can really pick up what's important without it being washed out. So if you look at this, this has no type ramp. This is more what people do. This is kind of different, so we'll um, make this red. And this is a different kind of importance, so I'll make it red and bigger. You have to remember, it's not that your content's different so that you change the typeface. You have to base your typeface and style difference on the importance level. Like even though it's some different content, is it as important as this other thing? That's what it should be based upon. So you can do this really neatly if you kind of edit yourself. The, um, I also want to explain proportions that work. And if you're not familiar with some of these really easy ones, rule of thirds is awesome. If you go into your phone and you go to settings, you can turn the grid on, it'll give you the rule of thirds. And what it, that, what it means is that when you take pictures, for instance, with the phone, instead of just flat out taking a picture, you can notice that um, this one is just disregarding the rule of thirds. But on this one, the rock formation is on a third, the land ends at a third, and the sky is two thirds. So it helps you to create a more interesting composition. In this case, the bird, flat in the middle, but if you just put it on the intersection, it looks a lot more dynamic. So Apple uses this a lot. You know, where, that's why you see a lot of threes and things on their site, where they're putting things. Do you see where the iPhone ends? Two thirds, where the text is, third, third. It gives you a place or a rule to put things, okay? Even text only, two thirds, one third. So when I'm creating something, again, I never do anything random. I'm like, I don't just make a gallery down the side a random size. I typically will use either the rule of thirds or the other one is the golden mean or ratio. And I know you guys know the next number for this, right? Three, four. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Zero and one equals one, and one and two equals three, three and five equals eight. This is MIT after all. This is MIT, <laughs> exactly. This was, um, the golden mean comes from, or golden ratio, it's got a lot of names to it. It actually um, was, this proportion was discovered by Fibonacci in a mathematical competition back in 1225, I believe it was. I do have a YouTube video. Hopefully I can post this for you guys someplace so you can see this stuff. But um, it was actually a study on rabbits and he started paying attention to a single pair of rabbits and um, when they had, um, babies, he was mapping out 
as they became productive, how many babies were becoming part of this whole, and it actually followed that proportion. But then it started to be recognized that it was also replicated in nature, and some plants branch in that, those proportions, and um, daisies and flowers, and even you know, like um, structures inside your body. How we use it as designers is, um, I'm wait. Yes, good. I escaped that. Is we might just recognize the um, the proportional value as a decimal. So to give you an idea, if I'm creating something for the web and you know, or an app or something, and I want a thumbnail for a window, I might take a square, and you can do this in Sketch too. But I'm going over to the width and making sure the width and height are unchained, and I'm just going to say times. 1.62, which is the digital, the decimal value for that proportion. And what that does is it turns my square into a perfect golden rectangle. And then I use that for thumbnails and things instead of just picking a random size, just because I know that's visually pleasing. The other thing you can do, I'm going to copy this and put it on top of itself and then just make it clear, is that I can take this and I'll do the same thing times 1.62 and this time I'm going to just slide this over. So this is the proportion right here, like this distance to this distance. And how you can also use this is use this distance to place things. So, if, And it can be squished, it can be adjusted, but I can take this and stretch it the whole length of my app you know, maybe this is a, a mobile app or something. And then I know that if I'm going to take advantage of this proportion, I'm going to get rid of some of this other stuff, that if I want a headline, I should put it here. And that, if I hide that grid, even that simple task is based upon Fibonacci's proportion, like where that is. So if you've ever seen things, it helps you to not do everything centered. I use a program, which I absolutely love, which is a $19 program um, called Phi Matrix. Um, and what it does is it brings up this proportion on your screen no matter what app you have open, and then you just stretch it to fit. And so I use it for PowerPoint decks, I use it for all sorts of things, but I can make it fit whatever I'm working on. And then I can go and add those, I can break down the proportions even further and further, and I can put the little loop in there. But, and then I can turn it off. But if you're really into like using this, um, it's kind of a neat little trick that you can take advantage of. Okay, so I gotta wrap this up. So I wanna make sure I am close to the end here. Um, so we talked about that. Replicated in the Nautilus shell. You see it used all over the place. Um, even in architecture at the Parthenon. Um, even in home building, you can see like the roof line. Um, Dieter Rams used it, used in websites and design. Like how wide do you make that one column? Well, let's base it upon this proportion. Logo design, it's almost right overused. So good, I think I made it. I was two minutes late. Um, <laughs> so does this help? Did it make sense? Yeah, is that a little too much in 50 minutes? make sure that I find, do you know if they're, we're posting these someplace? Oh, actually they're recorded. Oh, yeah. yeah so we're, you can watch this as many times as you want. It'll be on the YouTube, YouTube channel for DVD. Excellent, excellent. Any questions? I know I went over, so, well, I think we're just, yes. So the slogan, less is more, I, I thought that was Bauhaus. Is that later than Bauhaus though? It is actually, Dita Rams coined that term, okay. and that was more like the 1950s, but it, totally relates to the whole Bauhaus thing of fierce reduction of unnecessary elements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a trade-off um, between presenting too many things and having too many clicks. Because mm -hmm. you know, I think one thing that you want to design for is to not have users have to click through too many things. Oh, and that's how, why you have to recognize the scenarios and make sure that the things that they want to do most, that your users do most, don't have a lot of clicks. Like they're immediately there. Kind of like what BWI did, where they're like, you can click further to go find a restaurant in the airport, 
But we know that because we talk to our users that most of you just want this. So that's, that's why you really um, have to know your users. You have to know your users. Yeah. yeah. We, because Craigslist is perfect. You only have one click for no matter what it is. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but it's really, you don't even know what's there, you know what I mean? Like, there's just so much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but. I mean, it's, it's not, not really that simple. I mean, it comes down to information architecture. Yeah. It really comes down to the design of where your stuff is, you know, in order to do this. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. You don't want to take everything away and then make someone click six times to find something. Yeah. Right, that would be bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that, you know, I don't know if they're still kind the same design that they started with some time ago, but like the New York Times was a good example of getting tons of information on the one page. Yeah. And obviously it was because of the grid. Yeah. The, the grid plays a big part of it. Like that, but, um, it. It was like, it wasn't really less is more, but it was more really beautifully designed. It's, it's attention simple. to detail. Yeah, it mm -hmm. was very simple, so it did work well. Um, just one other question I had is, there's, there's been discussion and talk about, like, certainly within the design world, like, um, you know, things changing from this simple sense that are feeling that everybody is copied. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so there's been talk about making forms more softer, um, pastels. Um, okay, material. Google material design is a yeah. good example of the trend yeah. and where it's going. Yeah. It's really simple, it's really clean, but what was discovered in usability is that sometimes people don't know things are mm -hmm. clickable, so there's no affordance to it because it's so flat and so clean. Yeah. So, yeah, if you Google, Google material. <laughs> um, and look at some of their examples, it's really nice because they do use some slight drop shadows, not overbearing. They yeah. use transparency. They use a really nice like color scheme where things are overlaying to help you know that things are clickable, but also taking away from the really stark um, Swiss look. So it's like a good transition right now. And the application, I think, like, like always, would drive the design style. Absolutely. Because Sometimes you can do very illustrious, beautiful things, but in terms of readability and when you're like thinking about user experience and you're thinking about everybody, it's very different than when you have a sort of huge audience. So, you know, obviously there's all the studies that are important, I would think. It, it, it all comes down to knowing your user. Yeah. 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 I think that one of the interesting design conversations that I keep seeing popping up everywhere is this, the idea of sameness and you know how we're getting this, we're tiring out of these layouts that are you know probably originated from a well-designed you know inspiration point, whether it be Apple or Google or whatever. That's where you're bootstrap. People, yeah, there's bootstrap, so everything becomes this. But it wouldn't come time. that. But when we look at the historical movement, there was purpose in that, yes. like you've illustrated to us. Like, there was a need for things to be efficient, to be, and they focused their time on finding out what was helpful to the people using them, whether right. it's a chair or a juicer or what, what not. not. So you're so much concerned about sameness, but right? Usability. So a template would not do your client justice you know, all the time. Yeah. Because you are finding what's unique and what differentiates them from other people, and that should play in the design. You know, what people are looking for for them. I, and I think sometimes art direction is downplayed in that conversation, in the fact that a template is a template, but you can bring life to that template with the things that you put into, whether it's your the font words. choice, your choice of photography or illustration. The words, the not always about the layout should be usable to people. Now let's talk about how we want to bring that to life. And, right. Um, websites are I, I, I mean, I teach, I teach UX, and we have a two-day overview up in Woburn like every four weeks, which is really fun, but we make people design an information architecture with post-its and like building it. Like we spend a lot of time on deciding what goes in there, and 
I always claim the information architecture is the biggest part of your design. Like that is the most important part. What do you say? What does that button say? Where is it placed? That's more critical than any visual design. Mm -hmm. The visual design is the icing on the cake. Right. Yeah. One of the nicest sites I've seen in this Airbnb design. Mm -hmm. um, have you looked through that? I have. I do, yeah. You know what? But the, I haven't paid attention to it, but that's a sign of good design. The best designs you don't notice. You what? Don't notice. The best well, designs are not noticed. I'm just thinking of it from a confidence standpoint. And, and uh, that becomes the issue is what you're putting on the screen more than how beautifully it's laid out or something. But, but the fact that it is simple and allows you to have that experience. You know? Right. But it allows you to reach your goal. The content is really amazing. But then again, they're, you know, they probably don't have a budget for it as much. So. It's, they have a big budget. So. Yeah, you should always have a budget for usability stuff because the <laughs> <laughs> because the financial return on it has been proven over and over again that it pays off. That's why UX designers are making right. a ton of money. Right, they spend money on their content. Where a lot yeah. of people might not do that. But everyone should. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're wasting development time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I say beautifully designed, I'm talking about simple. Yes. And, and elegant, and that's what they do. But the content is so raw and beautiful that it makes you want to read things. You know? Right. So. Yeah. That's the way it should be. Well, I think was there. Is it lunch or no? It is. So good. Nobody was coming in here. I was worried <laughs> I was going to have to get out. But if you guys have questions, um, let me know. Um, yeah, thanks.